His particular genius, I think, was that he was able to understand, to a great degree, the Western culture, and even though he was not born or raised here. Zen is a way of life. That's it. No core, no enlightenment, no God, no Buddha. Just sit with silence, with empty mind. He was one of the first people to come here. The odds against him and uh, the, the support base didn't exist. There was just this substantialness to his presence. One minute's practice, one minute's enlightenment. Ten minutes practice, ten minutes enlightenment. No expectation, no desire. Just sit. Very sit. This is the sort of thing. His style was really quite uh, remarkable. It was very practical and down to earth. This is the way you do it. And if you do this enough, you'll start to understand yourself in your own way. He just had this wonderful style of never criticizing, really. He would say, almost perfect, but before I forget. <laughs> and, then, and then he'd give you a correction, something to do differently. He had such uh, strength such confidence and uh, but it, it wasn't it, it never was arrogant there was never anything arrogant about it but it was a determination that he wanted to help people very gentle very kind very 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 nice person but there was a fire in how he spoke and an energy that he projected that was quite striking. Just the, this, this tremendous enthusiasm and a real desire to get his point across to help people. That made a great impression. He was a very important figure in the history of Zen and in its propagation to the West. And he was a unique uh, character an individual. My teacher, Soyu Matsuoka, whom you may not have heard of, who was a very early uh, teacher to come from Japan in 1939 to the United States. Who is this man and why have I not heard of him? Especially someone who might be familiar with Zen, you know? He didn't make a great effort to be, promote himself or become famous. 
my first thing is if I find someone I'm interested in, I'm going to Google them or go to the, you know, find a book by them or something, you know. Matsuo Garoshi was a person who he didn't really uh, like to talk about himself much. Kind of a humble person in that way. There's a lot of information there that he was not forthcoming about. He's very modest in that sense. Kiyosako may not be the easiest thing to find. It's not published by the San Francisco Zen Center, you know. And so why is that? That wasn't his goal. You know, it wasn't his goal for you to go to a library and find a whole bunch of books that he wrote or, you know, find a pretty picture that you can frame with a quote of his on there. You know? he, he passed away poor and, you know, relatively obscure, you know. But uh, I love that, you know. The research I've done, the, the reading and, and so forth that I've read about Matsuoka, I never find any motivation whatsoever of him trying to become any kind of icon, which I love. I think that makes him even more iconic, you know. Not that many people knew him, and uh, not that many people are even aware of him. He was born in 1912 and died in 1997. So Sensei was part of the um, first generation of Zen priests to come here. This was a fertile place for the propagation of Zen and Buddha Dharma. And I believe he was probably the first one who recommended Zen meditation for Westerners. Many of the early teachers did not think that we were ready for that. The man who brought Soto Zen practice Zazen practice to the United States. Is, uh, I think Matsugaroshi uh, is the first priest okay. who has a Zen center for uh, General America oh, to, mm -hmm. to spread uh, Soto Zen. Mm -hmm. As a pioneer of that kind of movement, you know, actual Zen practice in this country, I think Matsugaroshi is really important as a pioneer. He had great appreciation, as I mentioned before, for our approach, our energy, our dynamism. And I think he found in that something akin to the energy of Zen. After D.T. Suzuki wrote many books about yeah. Zen, uh, but he didn't practice. So uh, teachers like Matsuoka Roshi and a little later Suzuki Roshi and Katagi Roshi and Maizumi Roshi actually introduced them practice. He had friends, other priests that were part of an, a network that developed after his arrival to support and help nourish that. He did all, all this stuff and none of it benefited him whatsoever. Certainly not financially, you know. It was to help these people, these American people, that he came.
don't think that's it. I do not recall that, uh, that case. sidewalk going to the back. But it was this color and nobody else is that color on the car. Was there a balcony in the second floor? It's, it says it's a hotel. This is at 2230, right? I do believe that's it. This is where it all began. This is the Chicago Zen Buddhist Temple. I began practicing here, I believe, in 66, maybe 65. 1970, when Matsuoka Roshi moved to Long Beach, I moved to Atlanta. Uh, how did he establish the Chicago Zen Center in the beginning? With apparently no money. Who helped him? Who were his patrons, right? Uh, there are a lot of economic questions. Uh, just the practicality of, of making it all work. My name is Tyun Michael Elliston, abbot of the Silent Thunder Order and the Atlanta Soto Zen Center. I first met uh, uh, Tyun Roshi, um, Tyun Elliston Roshi, uh, in Chicago. Tyun is my Dharma name. Uh, it means Great Cloud. It was given to me by my teacher, Matsuoka Roshi, Soyu Matsuoka. Matsuoka Roshi came back from Long Beach. Uh, probably around Ohigan, spring and fall equinox, and we would have ceremony and celebrations. I lived in Chicago, and Tayun Roshi had moved to Atlanta, and he, he would have come back home uh, to see his teacher, uh, Matsuoka Roshi. And I knew of Tayun Roshi, but I didn't know him well at that time. Uh, but he had founded a center in, uh, in Atlanta, so that was, a, it was the first Soto Zen Center in the South. I have an empathy uh, for somebody who's trying to learn something. I'm very pleased that that, that that was taking place. You're you're familiar with photography and music and various things in your life. Uh, anybody who ever has to teach something that is second nature to them, you have to start clarifying it to yourself. And you know when we say teaching in Buddhism, this takes on many forms. He is a designer. I think I had the benefit not only of being trained in design, which is kind of a universal tool, kind of a universal application. Everything is designed. Everything can be redesigned. I think a recent cover of the New York Times Magazine said the redesign of everything, our obsession with the redesign of everything. If we look at contemporary culture, it's a wonderful thing, this uh, wonderful design process that's redesigned our automobiles, it's redesigned all the digital media, everything is constantly undergoing revision that way. For me, entering into a full-time uh, Zen life on a more, you might say, professional level, trying to make it work for everybody, I think I was really aided by my background in design. Uh, Tayan Roshi comes with a very creative understanding of things. There's a method a very systematic method for really designing anything. And uh, when you begin to apply it to, well, how do we establish a Zen practice in America? What are the techniques? How do we sit physically? How do we breathe? How do we, what do we do with the mind? A lot easier to try something and give it up and try something else if it doesn't work that well. By having the advantage of also being put in a position at 25, 26 years old to teach design to college students, I had to really think through it and, and figure out how to go in there with 30 people and how do I now start introducing this subject to say graphic design, how do, how, you know, where, how do we start and then where do we go? But I think my training in design and then teaching design put me in a unique position to be able to uh, see what was working in the way we're presenting Zen or Buddhism and what is not working and how to modify that over time to, to fit the audience. Being a teacher before getting into teaching Zen was very, very helpful. I can tell when Tayun Roshi speaks, I can hear, you know, uh, Matsuoka Roshi. So 
So my name is Jerry Smyers. Uh, my Buddhist name is Zenku. So typically, I, I like to be called uh, Zenku, especially when I'm with the Sangha and the community of uh, Buddhists. We are in my Zendo. Uh, this is Mission Mountain Zen here in Dayton, Montana. We have a little small room upstairs in my home, and uh, this is where we meet. After uh, Kango Roshi had passed, throughout the years that I studied with him, how close he and Matsuoka Roshi were. And so I shared that affinity for both of them. Uh, I started to think about perhaps studying with uh, Tayun Roshi. What I found was uh, the simpatico nature of how he felt about uh, Matsuoka Roshi. I felt uh, the family, sort of our tradition, you know, under Matsuoka Roshi, kind of uh, welled up in me and it just felt kind of like home. I could see the style of Taiyun Roshi was somewhat different than Kango Roshi, giving me uh, different aspects. I, I tend to be a very practical person, very matter of fact, where Taiyun Roshi has a little bit of a different notion. There would be times when we would be talking about a problem or a challenge or an opportunity. I would think in terms of, well, we do this, this, and this. Uh, Taiyun Roshi had quite a different perspective and a, maybe a very creative perspective. And uh, let's, let's try this, you know, where I might go with some old tried and true ideas. See, the one problem with uh, having an approach which is matter of fact, sometimes you kind of get boxed in. This is what I uh, enjoyed very much about working with Taiyun Roshi, and I've learned quite a bit because of uh, that different perspective. Tessin Stuart Erickson was the seventh. Tessin means Iron Mountain, and that was the name Congo gave him. Very direct personal contact with Matsuoka Roshi. And Tessin had been Congo's student as well and had become his disciple. As a teenager, you know, growing up at that time, you know, having come from a very sheltered, very conservative family. I certainly didn't feel prepared for the world that I was entering into. Like Zenku, was a longtime student in Chicago. I feel an amazing, precious gift has fallen into my lap. And life has turned out far more interesting and far more exciting and far more generous than I could have ever possibly imagined when I first came to the temple many years ago. In fact, he is the one who put uh, Matsuoka Roshi up in his home when he was brought back from uh, California, when he was in his decline. And so we owe Tessan a great debt of gratitude and it sustained me over a lifetime. And how deeply I want to share that. Matsuoka Roshi came over to the United States about 1939 and uh, began teaching. You know, I don't think we know the full answer to the question, why did he come to America in the first place? He was only 27 years old. His mother told him, go die in America. I really admire his uh, effort to transmit uh, so those to American uh, people. When Matsuo Kuroshi came to the United States, he had some challenges. You know, Sotoshi sent list their activity was were limited within Japanese American community until I think around 1960s. So when Matsuoka Roshi came to this country, not so many Americans are interested in their practice. The other Japanese priests have told me uh, that they came over and tried to establish a Zen center and failed and went back. It, really, it must be really difficult. He was really a pioneer. He could have stayed in Japan and risen in the, in the ranks. Uh, he came just at the very beginning, uh, just before World War II broke out. 
So I think his heart of compassion, his concern for uh, the West, he was probably well informed as to how America was progressing. He could see in the mid-30s there what was happening in Germany and, and where this was all probably going, and he saw the Axis powers developing in Japan and how they were possibly the underpinnings of the alliances with Germany and Italy were beginning to form. And maybe that was part of the impelling force to say, I, I need to go to America now, you know, because this is all going to hit the fan. Who knows how prescient he was. You know, he was primarily here and worked with the, the Japanese communities uh, in terms of uh, Buddhism and lead uh, in, uh, in the community in that respect. But nonetheless, he was suspected, he was suspicious, and so he was placed in an internment camp and uh, he had that to overcome, you know, right away. It had to be pretty shocking what actually happened, what, turned, what transpired once he got here. And so whatever those original uh, uh, motivations were on the superficial level, they had to fall away pretty quickly. How did this figure emerge, you know, out of those pre-war time conditions and then survive through the war here as, you know, uh, an alien, <laughs> rounded up and put in the camps? It's, it's, it's a very complicated history as we are finding out more and more. He was interred in the camps during the war and he taught the Japanese people how to do Zen meditation. After internment in the Japanese camps, that he continued, uh, he went back to Japan, so you know he had to witness the devastation sometime post-war. Uh, but then they come back to the United States and go back there, and he was a bridge builder. Uh, a couple of his talks were called Zen Can Bridge East and West. And he was known for that, uh, particularly in Japan, as he was always promoting the USA to Japan. And here he was always promoting Japan to us, to the USA. So before and after the war, he was known as this peacemaker and bridge builder. Uh, and so that was a mission going on no matter what circumstances were unfolding in the world. And I think it was a testament to his sort of universal perspective on compassion that he was able to not turn bitter he saw the Buddha nature in everybody, as some of the other guys saw. He saw the Buddha nature. That was uh, quite an uh, amazing accomplishment, and he got caught up in it. And so he continued to try to build this uh, rapprochement between the United States and Japan, who had formerly been enemies. He really became a man without a country. He was caught between two worlds. He wasn't you might say fully Japanese and he wasn't fully American either. He wasn't either. He was in between. Coming from that point in time, one of the earliest uh, Japanese Zen teachers to come to this country and to see how uh, he was like the first wave and to talk with Akiba Roshi, to talk with Okamura Roshi and to get their uh, deep respect and understanding of the difficulties that Matsuoka Roshi must have overcome because uh, when they came, they overcome many difficulties also. But with Matsuoka Roshi, he came, it was like a, a blank sheet of paper. No infrastructure, you know. There was no inf Zen infrastructure in this country when he came. And so, of course, he had to be very resourceful. He had to adapt and he had to kind of boil Zen down to the essence, you know, of what is Zen all about and help a very, uh, you know, a, a culture that had, didn't know anything about Buddhism generally, help them start to get them to understand what is going on. And uh, certainly I think that um, he made amazing progress after he founded the temple here in 49. Uh, during the 50s, I know a little bit less about that uh, than 
But, but, but by, by the time the early 60s came along, we had a lot of people searching uh, in general because we had world conflicts, we had a whole generation of individuals who were very concerned about what, where the world was going, what was, what was it all about. And so, and there was, so it was an outreach to the East, and I think that really was a very important development that carried uh, Matsuoka Roshi's message forward, because American students came more and more to the temple. And so that began, really, I think, what we know about his uh, teaching, first teaching and uh, spreading uh, Zazen uh, knowledge in this, in this country. How was your flight? Long. Long, I know, it's long, but right. good. Right in the sun. Long, long, long. Actually, I'm sure I... Tessa was here. She went that way and disappeared. <laughs> 